A taxi driver lies murdered in a suburban street. What happened? Who killed him and why? And what are the vital clues that will reveal the truth to Operation Edgewater? A crime scene is a puzzle that has to be solved. A whodunit, a scattering of clues to be deciphered by clever detective work and the power of science. Our case begins in the early hours of the morning in the tree-lined streets of suburban Auckland. The neighbours in View Road were alerted to the accident by the crash of the car hitting the tree, basically. It was, it was a very loud bang, it was described as. So a number of people came out of the apartments there. My flatmate said it sounded like a um, wheelie bins, like somebody had gone into them. I walked towards the passenger side. It wasn't until I got about a metre away that I realised that his car was still running and his foot was on the accelerator. They found the driver of the car uh, slumped at the wheel and his engine on and his wheels spinning into the grass on the grass verge. Another guy was trying to help me as well, you know, and we were trying to stop the bleeding where, where it was coming out the most. Initially, they thought that he had had a car accident and that he crashed into the tree. It became obvious quite quickly that he had some stab injuries. He had two cuts on either side of his face and punctual wounds all over his body. I instantly knew that this guy has been stabbed. This isn't a normal car crash. I said to him that everything will be OK. He looked me in the eyes and um, told me his name was Harin. I thought the ambulance had arrived, but it was a huge cargo of taxis. It must have been about 20 of them all in a row. What happened at that point was a number of taxi drivers made their way to the scene because they were able to tell from the machines in the taxi where he was located. Taxis have alert buttons that can be set off by the driver or automatically trigger on crashing. When the panic button goes off, there's a message comes across the head operator's screen that there is an emergency in the vehicle. They then notify immediate cars in the area to go to the assistance of that cab. Those drivers like nearby, they went for his help. One of them was my friend, and he called me up, and he said, it's Hiren Mohini, and he's bleeding, and he's not responding to my call. He just closed his eyes and just had real heavy breathing. Because I've grown up on the farm, I, I knew that sound, you know, of a dying animal. I related it to the breathing that he was uh, making, and I, in my head, I just thought, he's not going to make it. By the time I reached to the incident point, they were helping Hiren because he was bleeding, and these people, they got towel and put his own uh, wounds. The ambulance driver showed up, and then I, I felt like there was no need for me to be there. I went back home, jumped into the shower, and went out there and just was like, you know, just like a, a spectator. It all just hit me, you know, it was like a delayed reaction. So we thought, okay, the ambulance is there, help is there, so he'll be all good. But after 45 minutes of one hour, they came and they said, you must be know, knowing by this time that what has happened to your friends. They said, no. Then he told me that he's no more. Hiren Mahini was a married father of two. He actually was a, uh, was a qualified accountant back in India where he emigrated from. I couldn't find that sort of work here in New Zealand. And as a result, drove taxis to provide a live-in for his family. When I arrived, it was dark, so it was still 4.30 in the morning. 
There were a number of people that knew who normally drove that particular taxi, so it was very emotionally charged. There was a lot of crying and a lot of tears from people who just couldn't fathom what had actually happened. One of the main things you do at a crime scene when you get there is look at where you've set up your cordons, the points where you don't want anybody else coming into. If needs be, you push out those cordons to give you a bigger area of forensic opportunity. The police were very much trying just to slowly piece together, first of all, how we were going to carry out the scene examination, just making sure at that early stage, because it's the most important stage, that we didn't miss anything as well. I have questions going through my head. Who's been in this scene? What has happened in this scene? Why has it happened and how has it happened? I carried out a visual examination of the vehicle. The majority of the blood staining was around the driver's side of the vehicle. There was also blood staining on the ceiling above where Mr Mahini was sitting. The results of that examination yielded what we believe to be the, uh, the murder weapon, which was a small kitchen knife. We first saw the handle of the knife in the footwell behind the driver's seat. The blade had actually snapped during the course of the attack, and one half of the knife was in the rear of the vehicle, and the other half was in the front footwell. What has gone on for the person to take a knife out and to inflict those injuries? thinking maybe there's a robbery, so looking at, OK, where's the money, where's the wallet? Robbery's always thought of as a motive for these attacks, but nothing was stolen. So it was a very peculiar case because we had a, an extremely violent attack with no clear suspect and, at that time, no, no clear motive. A dead body, no suspects and no motive. What answers will science be able to provide? The car was left as it had been found, so it was on the footpath with the uh, side of it against a brick wall, if I remember rightly, and the front driver's door was open. Investigators examined the scene. What were the sequence of events leading up to the crash? There was crash damage to the front right corner, which came from hitting the brick wall and the fence. Crash damage to the front left corner, from where the car hit the ornamental tree and came, came to a stop there. Unusually, there were no skid marks or any evidence of braking. There was no head strike to the windscreen, which um, if it was a sudden stop, you would expect um, unrestrained passengers to maybe hit the windscreen. But there was blood spatter. What can that tell us? Dion Shepard's a senior forensic scientist at ESR. He analysed the patterns of the blood inside the taxi to determine the actions that caused the blood shed. And he did this with a very clever forensic tool, a laser scanner. We scanned all the way around the outside and through the inside of the taxi to create the 3D model of the vehicle. We also recorded the blood staining that's across the inside of the windscreen. That's amazing. Gosh, it looks like a photograph. We can see everything in very good detail, can't we? What did you discover at the scene of this crime within the taxi? So we're able to look at those blood stains that are produced and then map a visualisation that shows where the blood has come from. And so we wanted to use our blood stain pattern analysis skills to visualise the position of the victim at the time of the injuries being sustained. So when a person's injured and they're bloodied, any impact or force applied to the blood causes blood to kind of spatter outward, sort of like stomping in a puddle of water. You hit it with your foot and the water splashes out. The same thing happens with blood spatter. In this case, it was interesting to try and see, has the blood across the inside of the windscreen resulted from the victim falling against or hitting the steering wheel as part of the vehicle crashing, or is it related to the assault and the stabbing that occurred? Now, the lines we can see here represent the flight path of those blood stains from where they came from, that bloodied person, to where they ended up on the windscreen. The area we can see here in the centre where the lines cross over is the area of origin, the position of that bloodied surface at the time the impact spatter is generated. And that's just above the steering wheel, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's above the steering wheel and in front of the headrest. So that allows us to consider that the most likely origin of that is the injury or the stabbing event causing the impact spatter to be generated. That's powerful information, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. 
Blood pattern analysis has determined all the blood shed in the taxi was a result of the stabbing and not from the crash. With a homicide investigation, the most important part of the scene is the body. So we carried out a preliminary examination of the body in the ambulance. Behrim had a number of stab wounds and cut wounds around his arms and hands, which were defensive wounds, as he was obviously trying to keep his attacker off him. Uh, a number of cuts and stabs around uh, his torso. I was able to determine that it was most likely that the offender was sitting in the back seat directly behind where Mr Mahini was sitting. You can only imagine just, just how ferocious an attack it was with the number of wounds he received, which were around about 30. Only one wound was fatal, uh, and that wound went straight into his heart. That wound uh, wasn't survivable, so it wouldn't have mattered how quickly medical attention got to him. He was going to die. The homicide investigation began gathering forensic and physical evidence. A priority for the police was to get the GPS unit out from inside the vehicle. That may help identify where the taxi driver had previously been that night. Myself and the fingerprints officer went round the vehicle and collected evidence that may tell us who may have actually have been in contact with that vehicle. In this particular scene, a lot of it was deductive logic in that you're assuming that the person probably got in from the passenger side because the taxi would have pulled up to a footpath. So the focus was on the back right door and the back left door. There were some blood touch marks on the rear passenger doors. That could have been from the people who went to rescue the taxi driver, or it could have been from the offender as they were leaving the vehicle. The best evidence you're ever going to get from any crime scene is the offender's print in the victim's blood, because that's just gold. So that's what we would always be hoping to achieve out of any crime scene. The priority was to collect a sample of the blood so we could find out whose blood it was, but also to collect the fingerprint evidence within the blood staining. What we decided to do in our plan was that we would fingerprint everything first, and then where the fingerprints developed, the ESR would come along afterwards and swab. Because we'd used sterile powder, there was no risk of any contamination. So in this instance, I went through and powdered the entire taxi and I ended up taking away 50 different fingerprints or palm prints from the taxi. Everyone who had touched that vehicle had left a print, and they weren't all visible. If you were to hold this cup now, you've just left your fingerprints behind on that cup. So your fingerprints are there to provide friction and grasp, and you have tiny little pores that sit on your ridges. So now that you've touched that cup, the sweat that's sitting on the top of those pores has spread out along your ridges, and that pattern's been left behind on the cup. I'm just going to put a bit of magnetic powder on your fingerprints, which will hopefully develop them up quite nicely for us. Wow, look at that. So these patterns, your fingerprints, are uh, divided into three basic pattern groups. So you've got a wheel, which is a circular pattern. You have a loop, which is what these are. It actually goes around like that in a loop. And we have what we call an arch. And how long will that fingerprint last for? There's a lot of variables that govern how long a fingerprint lasts on a surface. So if I was to put this in a cupboard and nobody was to touch it, that fingerprint could potentially last for a couple of years, even longer. If you were to touch something like a piece of paper, your fingerprints will actually absorb into the paper, and you're talking hundreds of years for that fingerprint to remain within that paper. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah, it's a very useful surface for us to work with paper. Once a print has been identified and powdered, it's lifted and transferred to a backing sheet for analysis. And that is now becomes our piece of evidence from our crime scene. Fingerprints from a taxi were problematic for us in that pretty much any person who'd been in the taxi during the course of the last time the taxi was washed could potentially have left their fingerprints behind. But one piece of evidence appeared to be from the killer. The knife came to us and we had a look at fingerprints on the knife. We did develop a palm print. It was a very, very partial, very poor palm print. Essentially, it was what we call a borderline print, and had it not been such a serious offence, 
we probably would have said that it was unsuitable, that there wasn't enough information in it. But given that it was a whodunit, it was the, the weapon, we spent actually spent weeks on this particular image that came from the knife blade. But the print on the knife was unusable. So multiple prints lifted from the car had to be run through the fingerprint database. When we load a fingerprint into the database, we actually have to manually sit here and put all the features into the picture. And when we put those in, what we do is get it to measure the distance between all these points, and then you basically send it away for a search. So these are like landmarks on a map. Yes, The church, the school, yep. the police station, the hospital, and it's measuring the distances between those landmarks. Yep, that's a really great analogy. That's exactly what it's doing. And what it is actually doing now is giving me the print that I've entered, and that's the print that's come from the database that it believes is a match. And did you make a match with the fingerprint that you'd found on the taxi? Well, what we did is we put the prints through the database, um, and in this instance, we didn't get a positive result. So that was an indication to us that the offender wasn't actually on our database. Disappointed? Very disappointing, yeah. It's always a nice, nice finish when you do actually get a match from the database, but that's not to say that a match doesn't come from some other avenue later on in the piece. Fingerprints believed to be the killers failed to be matched. Will DNA science hold the key? There was blood staining on the back right door, so the priority was to collect a sample of the blood so we could find out whose blood it was. Areas without blood are also swapped for trace DNA. Trace evidence you can't see. Um, trace evidence is easily transferred and easily lost. So you leave trace DNA behind on a surface when you touch a surface, so handling a door, we potentially collect DNA from everybody who's touched that particular door handle. We also collected trace DNA from where in the vehicle that I thought a person might touch if they were travelling in the vehicle. It's a taxi. A number of people have been sitting in that taxi. Therefore, anything that we find may not actually be related to the investigation. 19 people had been in legitimate contact with the taxi before and after the accident. Once their DNA was eliminated from the investigation, one area became of particular interest. The door handle on the inside back right door gave us a DNA profile. Within that DNA profile, there was DNA from both the deceased, Mr Mohini, as well as from an unknown person. And that unknown person from day one we referred to as male A. When we get unknown DNA profiles, we have a database in which we load them to. This database has profiles from criminals, volunteers and samples from unsolved crimes. Successful matches are made in around 70% of New Zealand cases, but not in this case. The DNA profile from male A came back with no matches. It was an extremely unusual scenario to have a, a stranger homicide with the DNA of, of the, or who we believe to be the offender uh, not known to us. An unknown killer was on the loose, and anxiety was rising about whether or not he'd strike again. After this incident, I didn't drive at all. Like, I was not feeling getting in the car. I was that scared because I was just thinking of what go had gone with herein. Police were working on several different leads. Data analysed from the taxi's GPS could reveal where the last passenger was picked up. And officers were canvassing the area of the homicide, looking for further information. One of the witnesses that came out from, from the apartments saw what we believed to be the offender running up the street and out of view. So we had a start point as to, as to where we thought the, the offender had gone. We got a phone call that told us that a member of the public looked at his recycling bin, which had been out for a week because he'd missed the previous week's recycling, and I think it was due to be collected the next day or so. So it wasn't far away from being collected, and he noticed that the lid was up, and on the top of the bin was a blue bag, uh, and in the bag was a towel uh, and a hat and what appeared to be blood staining. But I don't think he was entirely sure what he was going to do with it, but he spoke to his partner, who basically said to him, 
do you not think that might be connected to all that's been going on? It was only about half a kilometre from the murder scene. So that's the reason that they phoned it in. I sent a couple of officers straight out there and we just lifted the bin up as it was, everything that was in it, and took it back for examination. The hat, bag and towel were examined by forensic scientists. We weren't sure that it was actually linked to the offence or if it had been legitimately left there by another person. If there is a link between these items and the crime, will science be able to find it? The DNA profiling results obtained from the samples, there were several mixed DNA profiles, which means that DNA from more than one individual is detected. When DNA is mixed together, it used to be very difficult to separate into individual profiles. But now scientists at ESR have created a new tool. Joanne Bright is one of the creators of StarMix. OK, so by wearing your lab coat now, I'm depositing my DNA onto this coat? That's right. Now for the test. Will we be able to identify both our DNA on the coat? First, we collect the trace evidence. I can't see anything. Uh, no, so what we're looking for are skin cells. So, so we can't see skin cells, but what I'm going to do is collect them using this mini tape, it's double-sided sticky tape, and I'm just going to pick them up using the tape. Now I'm going to put the tape into a tube that I've previously labelled. And here you go, here's the sample that we've collected from the lab coat ready for processing. So this is the two sources of DNA mixed together displayed as one entity. That's right, so that's what we collected from the lab coat. So forensically, the challenge here is to separate those two bits of genetic information and say, well, these are two separate people and this is their genetic information. That's exactly right. How does it do that, though? Because surely if you've got two sources of DNA, it's like shuffling a pack of cards. How do you rearrange those as two discrete or three discrete piles of cards? There's a little bit more information in the DNA profiles. So we can look at the height of these peaks. So I can see that there is about 20 times more DNA from this individual. And StarMix uses that information to work out the, the likely DNA profiles of the individual contributors. That's pretty cool. We think so. In our case, scientists deciphered the mixture of DNA on the bag and towel found in the rubbish bin. Blood stain from the bag, there was a mixture of DNA from most likely two individuals, and that mixture could be explained by a mixing of DNA from the deceased and male A. The DNA profile that we've obtained from the cap linked with the DNA profile of the unknown person, male A, and related to the investigation. That's the kind of evidence police were looking for, and DNA science provided one more clue to our suspect's identity. When we were unable to identify him as per his DNA, the ESR did some tests for us around trying to find where somebody with that DNA match might come from. Even though they didn't have a DNA match, they were able to compare the profile to others in the database for similarities on the Y chromosome, for things like ethnicity. We have Eastern, Western Polynesian, Caucasian, Asian and other. In this instance, the two instances of this YSTR DNA profile are seen in the Asian database. So that gives us an indication the individual may have been of Asian descent. Out of those samples, uh, the indication was that our suspect was likely to come from the Shanghai area, which has got a population of about 19 million. So. Forensic science has provided vital clues to the identity of our killer. He's most likely Asian and carrying a very distinctive bag. So we were able to track him back to Sky City from the GPS unit that was in the vehicle, uh, and also the meter showed us where he would have left from. The retrieved GPS data from the taxi revealed the final route to the police. We had two teams of detectives working to basically go through every part of the city where we might capture CCTV. So that's from public cameras, private cameras looking through shop windows. We knew that there was a lot of cameras both inside and outside of Sky City. Myself and the team were tasked to obviously obtain that security footage from them. 
the teams also have to view that, and that, that is a huge task. That's thousands of hours of CCTV footage. We, we fully expected to be carrying on for, for months, trawling through footage and the like to try and get to our suspect. Sky City is located in central downtown Auckland. Its taxi stands are some of the busiest in the city. The Friday and Saturday night is Sky City rank. After 11 till 1 or 2, we are so busy, like we are just drive through. One of the officers made a breakthrough when he noticed a difference between the taxi he was looking at and the taxi driven by Hiran Mohini. On the side pillars of Mr Mohini's taxi, there's two labels on his and the taxi we were looking at, there was only one. And he determined that, no, that's not a taxi. They switched their focus to a different area. He just went back through it and looking at the right camera, identified a vehicle and a male getting into that vehicle. He was not supposed to jump in Hiren's car. He was just driving and coming, and by the time three, four cars moved, and Hiren's car moved, and this guy jumped in. So it was, you can say, totally bad luck, or wrong time and wrong place. That's what it was with Hiren. Now they had the suspect getting into the taxi, but could they track him to get a clearer picture? The blue bag had a white symbol on the side of it, which allowed us to pick it up on CCTV. Through that, we were able to piece the offender's movements from the bottom of Queen Street. We traced him down. I think the initial point we saw him was at a, at a telephone call box at the bottom of Queen Street. And then we were able to map him right the way up through to where he actually got into the rear of the taxi at the, the taxi rank at Sky City. Once they'd mapped his journey, police obtained private CCTV footage from every camera on that path. What they needed was a clear image of the suspect's face. We got one piece of footage that, that was quite clear uh, of him walking past a shop. That image showed a male walking along. The camera was from inside the shop going onto the footpath. It captured a good range of window frames. So looking through those window frames, you had the male walking past them. We then realised that we needed to circulate his image as widely as we could. We gave it out to media organisations, it was broadcast from 6 o'clock that night on all the lead news channels. We put it onto our website, so it was accessible via the internet. In dairies in and around the city, on a loop, so that people walked into a dairy could see those images moving. We did the same on the buses, which had screens on, on the main bus route through the city. So we were trying to capture as wide an audience as we possibly could. And probably one of the more novel things we did was we engaged a, a billboard in downtown Auckland, uh, where we put a very, very big billboard of that up, uh, appealing for witnesses. Once we got the picture on the TV that this is the suspect, then we thought, OK, we might get him. Inquiries like this, they, they ebb and flow. Um, so you, you'll get breakthroughs, which uh, you, you think gets you nearly there, only to, to find a, another door shutting on you. So we had the image, but we had nobody come forward to say who he was. We had the DNA, uh, but we didn't know who it belonged to. In a city of 1.4 million, how long would it take before someone would recognise the suspect? A couple of weeks later, we did get our breakthrough when a witness came forward uh, who identified our suspect. The witness that came forward basically used to work with our offender. And the reason they didn't come forward until that point was they'd been on holiday um, from late December, had returned into the country and had seen our suspect on that montage in their place of work. And as a result of that, uh, came to the conclusion that they knew the offender and their supervisor found us. He was known to them as George. His proper name is um, Xiao Jin, Xiao being the surname. And from that point, we talk about the, the inquiry ebbing and flowing. Well, that, at that point, the inquiry took off uh, again at some pace. What that prompts is an absolute flurry of activity of things that we need to do, and we need to do quite quickly. Finding out where he lived, his associates, and also looking at his activity on his bank account. We were able to trace um, his movements uh, on the night of the attack to an internet cafe in the city centre where his card had been used. By doing that, we were able to access um, CCTV footage within that place, which showed us prior to the attack, 
Xiao Jin walking into that uh, internet cafe with uh, the same clothing that he was wearing on the CCTV walking around the city and that and the the Daikon Abbey bag on his shoulder. Uh, he walked into that uh, injury free uh, and that was the last sighting of him. The inquiries there the next day bank card was used again in that premises uh, and, and we we viewed again him on security footage in there. And he walked into that place uh, in a completely different manner to the way he did the day before. He could barely stand. Um, he had clearly had a, a serious injury to his leg. He was hanging onto the counter and literally helped himself across the to where he needed to sit. That obviously matched the fact that male ace DNA was, was on the knife blade in the taxi, which led us to believe that in the course of the attack, he'd probably managed to stab himself as well. He also, on that very next day, had booked himself a, a one-way ticket to Shanghai. When we saw in the news that uh, this um, person who has done this left the country, then we thought it will be very, very hard for New Zealand police to get him in, from China or in China, because China is a very, very big country, and to go there and get him, it is very, very difficult. We, at that moment, I thought that now it will be not possible for New Zealand police to go and get him from there. A number of the pieces of the jigsaw were starting to fall into place, which made us confident that our suspect was Xiao Zhen, and that he'd left the country on the 5th of February, and we knew through the inquiries we made at the airport that he departed for, for Shanghai. We were able to track him going through uh, the departure gate on the night of Friday the 5th of February, departing for, for Shanghai. And we had a still image taken at the border which showed clearly that person looking remarkably like the person in, in our video footage. So we were confident that that was our suspect at that point. They had a suspect and they had a name. But could they be sure Shao Shen was the killer? Could science provide the proof? So what happened after a name was offered to the investigative team is they went and recovered the departure cards from any flights leaving to China. I ended up with 196 departure cards. Fortunately for me, by the time the departure cards came to me and I could do anything with them, there was only one of them we ended up having to look at because we had a name by then. Had we not had a name, all 196 of them would have been treated. And then those fingerprints that develop on the departure cards are then looked at against what we recovered from the taxi. And I developed two very nice prints off the departure cards, which could then be matched back to one of the lifts that came from the outside of the taxi. At this stage, we still had our male A DNA profile. We were looking to see whether or not we could find something else that had that same male A profile on it for comparison. So on that weekend, we executed a search warrant on his apartment. The apartment was in a high rise in downtown Auckland. The people who lived in the apartment with him had heard him come back home late that night in the early hours of the morning, had heard him go back to his room. We went in there and he had a small bedroom that was his, and then there was a common area that they all shared. The room had been cleared out. There was room beside the bed, probably to get changed, and that was really about it. It was, it was not built for comfort. We did recover three fingerprints from the bedroom door, but we also found under the bed some x-rays and a few other items of interest that we could potentially recover fingerprints on and took those away as well. We looked in all the expected areas where someone with blood on their hands might contact whilst they're inside the apartment. So we examined light switches and door handles, but didn't find any blood. Moving the mattress off the bed, we found a pair of socks and we found a pair of boxer shorts. So we took a trace DNA sample from inside of the waistband. There was also a semen stain on the inside front of the boxer shorts, which we cut out and removed. 
the DNA profile that we obtained from that semen stain matched our male A profile. And then at that point we were reasonably confident that we had that link to identify Mr Zhao as being involved in some shape, form or size with the homicide investigation. Basically everything came together at that point. We were confident, or well, we were 100% certain I should say, that, um, that Xiao uh, was our offender. Now we're still in a difficult position because we haven't actually physically extracted DNA from our suspect, but we know that the boxer shorts, which we can attribute to him in his department, match male A's DNA. So at that point, we're very happy um, that this is our suspect. But what could be done when their suspect was out of the law's reach in China? Now, from a very early stage, we knew through the Chinese authorities that extradition wasn't going to be an option. Uh, Chinese law specifically legislates against extraditing their own citizens. They indicated early on that they would be willing to, to trace him and to look at prosecuting him for our offence uh, in China, which was previously uh, never done before. So it was, it was new ground for everybody. His parents had actually given him an apartment on the outskirts of Shanghai, where he was living. When they located him, he was put under surveillance, so they knew exactly where he was. They forced entry and arrested him in the apartment. He was the only person there, taken back to the main police station in Shanghai. And at that point, I went to Shanghai to assist them with dealing with, with our offender. Once we got to Shanghai, he was already under arrest. We obtained the DNA sample from him, uh, some fingerprints. Xiao Shen's DNA profile and fingerprints were returned to New Zealand and compared to the samples found at the crime scene. The profile obtained from Mr Zhao was compared directly to the blood stain that was found inside the vehicle, the blood staining that was found on the bag and on the cap and the semen stain from the boxer shorts. So all of those unknown profiles that we'd previously been referred to as male A had now been identified as DNA originating from Mr Zhao. So now they had DNA confirmation. But what had gone on that night that led to such a frenzied attack and the murder of a man he'd never met? The first piece of CCTV footage finds him walking up Queen Street, heading towards his apartment. But halfway up, he turns and doubles back and heads towards Sky City's taxi stand. Where was he going? What was his intention? And why was he carrying a knife? He was quite a loner. He didn't really uh, have much in the way of friends here. A couple of them described him as having a gambling problem and having borrowed money off them. Somebody else claimed that he was prone to temper. Hira Mahini picked up our offender, uh, Xiao, at about 1.13 in the morning at Sky City. The taxi rank there. He's seen on video footage getting in the rear of that taxi. The GPS unit shows the vehicle being driven uh, along a route into Mount Eden, into View Road, where it, it comes to a virtual halt. The customer might have started arguing, or Hiren might have thought that this customer might give him trouble, so he must have stopped the meter and asked the customer to go out of the car. We believe uh, at that point where it slowed down to a stop, uh, was where the attack probably happened. Xiao Shen gave his own version of events when he was arrested in China. He stated that he got in the taxi, just wanted to go for a drive. As they were driving towards View Road, they had an argument um, where some anti-Chinese comments were made. He asked the taxi to stop. The argument continued. He says he feared for his safety and that he, st he stabbed Hiran Mahini uh, as part of that. I think the comments he made in his statement, he was probably trying to put an anti-Chinese slant on it to garner some sympathy in court as to the reasons for why he did it. There was nothing there for a motive. I couldn't really understand why, why, why it happened. Why he stabbed a man over 30 times. He's the only person who knows what really went on that night. Everybody who knew Hiramahini described him as a very gentle man. 
He was very calm-headed. He will never get angry. I have never seen him angry at all. He's had runners in the past, and he's even, you know, said to the people, you know, you've forgotten something. You've left it in the car. Come back and get it. Don't worry about the money. You know, he was that type of person. The reason for the attack to me um, still remains a mystery. There was no element of self-defense uh, in the attack. The wounds Hirun had around here especially, uh, and on his arms, uh, indicated that he was being attacked um, from the rear. You can only imagine just, just how ferocious an attack it was with the number of wounds he received, and the fact that during the course of the attack, Shao had actually managed to stab himself in the leg, and during the course of the attack, that knife had broken. On the outside of the taxi, there was also some fingerprints recovered. There was only one fingerprint on the taxi that belonged to the offender, and it was a palm that was developed on the rear driver's side door of the taxi. Following the attack, Shao had, had run up uh, View Road, uh, and it was seen, we believe, by a witness who described a, a male running away with a bag, and basically he was lost sight of at that point. I presume he would have been panicking, so he's just found the first opportunity to, to throw that away and would have carried on up into uh, his apartment, where we know he accessed his apartment because he had an electronic swipe card. He pretty much locked himself in his room that whole time. Only came out to eat and then locked himself in, kept his lights off. I I'm fairly confident that he thought he got away with it. I don't think he thought that we knew who he was or where he was. I think uh, he was fairly confident that he was going to carry on a normal life in China and not be bothered by us. I had absolutely no qualms with him being tried in, in a Chinese court. There was absolutely no alternative if we wanted to come to a conclusion and to get justice for Hiramahini's family. It's not a jury trial, there's a panel of three judges. They then delivered the verdict uh, at that same court uh, that found him basically guilty for what is the equivalent charge of murder in China, and he was sentenced to 15 years imprisonment. I think the verdict was fair, uh, it's uh, what we'd hoped for, and I think the, uh, the sentence uh, was, was according to the crime. It's very rewarding when you finish a case and to get a conviction when you put that much work into it and it's a solid conviction is, is very rewarding. An investigation such as this where you dedicate a number of hours working, doing at times quite methodical, mundane work, where in this particular case we identified a man who had caused the death of another person. It's nice to know that the work that you've done has contributed to finding justice for the family who have been involved. A law now governs security camera systems and 24-hour emergency alert facilities in taxis. That makes life that little bit safer for us all. He was working that late shift basically to provide money for a young family in the country that he'd emigrated to to find a better life. So um, I can't think of anything more uh, tragic th than what happened to him. Without science, we may have never known who killed Hiran Mahini or convicted his killer in a Chinese court using forensic evidence from New Zealand. <laughs>